Hey, are you forgetful at all? How many of you have ever forgotten your keys? How about your glasses? What about a wedding ring? I, I, I just found mine after losing it for the, I don't know, umpteenth time. Or how about your deodorant? Did you ever forget your deodorant? Yeah, that's what the person next to you is saying with uh, right now. When I was a little boy, uh, I went to see my grandmother and my grandfather and staying with them. And one day, uh, my grandmother and I were going to walk to town, a small town in Kansas, and we were going to walk to town and meet my grandfather. So we were walking along the sidewalk. We walked down the steps from her front porch, got on the sidewalk and began to, began to go down. And she was holding my hand. I was very small at the time. And we were playing that uh, step on a crack, break your mother's back game, you know. And all of a sudden, in the middle of that, my grandmother stopped and said, oh, my, oh, my. And then she said, come on, Mikey, and started dragging me as she ran back to the house. It seemed that she got all ready to go, but forgot her dress. She was just wearing a slip. And sure enough, when we got back to the house, there was the dress laying on the bed. Now, that doesn't, that doesn't specifically relate to Joseph, the subject of the series that we are doing here, but there is a real similarity. Do you remember from last week how Potiphar's wife tried over and over again to seduce Joseph? So much so that on one particular day, he had to make a mad dash away from her. He literally had to, had to run from her, didn't he? The problem was he left his robe in her hands, which she used then to falsely accuse him. In her anger for being scorned, she yelled to her servants, Look, Joseph tried to have sex with me, but I screamed, and he ran away. And then when her husband Potiphar returned, she said, Really? This is the way your slave treats me? See, I have his cloak to prove it. And of course, Joseph was apprehended, and he was thrown into prison. And some commentators, by the way, believe that he stayed in that prison for about 13 years. Now, how many of you know that's a long time to suffer for something you did not do, isn't it? Can you imagine sitting in jail all alone, no family to visit you for something you truly did not do? Can you imagine the hopelessness of something like that? Which is why I support the Innocence Project and others like them who are working uh, diligently to free falsely accused men and women in our prison system today. Because listen, there is no suffering in this world worse than the suffering that comes from being hopeless. Would you agree? Let me read some verses to you from Genesis 39 and 40 so that we can kind of set the stage for what I want to talk to you about today. Beginning in verse 20, Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. But while Joseph was there in prison, the Lord was with him. Let me say that again. While Joseph was there in prison, the Lord was with him. He showed him great kindness and granted it favor in the eyes of the prison warden. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all those held in the prison, and he was made responsible for all that was done there. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. And then in chapter 40, the first verse says, so some time later, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt offended their master, the king of Egypt. Pharaoh was angry with his two officials, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker, and put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard in the same prison where Joseph was confined. By the way, if you're following along in your Bible, underscore that word confined. What a telling picture that paints of suffering, yes? Because when I hurt, when I'm forgotten like Joseph was, when I'm ignored, when I'm suffering, it's like I'm bound and paralyzed, unable to really live my life. I just kind of exist. And that's a horrific place to be, is it not? 
But here's the flip side. Here's the good news. If you are hurting or suffering or know someone who is, we can learn something positive from Joseph's prison experience. Three things, actually, today. And the first one is that God still works good out of everything. Romans 8, 28 verifies that, where Paul said, And we know God works all things together for good to those who love Him and who've been called according to His purpose. And notice, by the way, that verse doesn't say God causes evil and bad and suffering, just that He promises to make good emerge from all of that bad. And notice, too, that the verse doesn't say all things are good because they're not. Everything we face in our day-to-day uh, is not good. Would you agree? Pain is not good. Disease is not good. Cancer is not good. COVID is not good. Even death is not good. Paul called it in the New Testament our final enemy. It's like this. I, I have some food items here with me today. And suppose uh, I just ask you to eat some of this that I have in the bowl. Suppose I were to ask you to eat this raw egg. Some of you might do that, I guess, but most of you would balk. What about this flour right here? Would you take a big handful of that flour and, and uh, just throw it in your mouth? Or this baking soda? How about that? Would you, would you take a big swig of that and just pour this down your mouth right straight from the bottle? Or maybe, or maybe uh, and I know you're saying, oh, yeah, no, I wouldn't do that. But what about this? What about... What about this bottle of vanilla extract? Actually, some of you probably would chug this down. I better not go there. How about this stick of butter? Would you eat a stick of butter? Some of you, again, may do that, but most of you would say, no, I wouldn't do that. Ah, but when you put all those together and you mix them up and you bake them properly, the end result is something that every one of us would eat, something very scrumptious. Would you agree? Maybe something like this piece of cake that I'm going to have as soon as I get finished preaching today. Would you, would you agree with that? Doesn't that look good? Well, it's all mine, no one else's. Anyway, all the ingredients of life are not good in and of themselves. Some are bitter, some are hard to swallow. But then God takes all that suffering and all that I'm forgotten and works something good and often beautiful and even yummy out of those things. Or think of it this way. You remember reading about the day Jesus was crucified, right? It was a dark and horrible time as he hung on that cross. His followers were devastated. It was a bad, bad Friday. But now today, look, to us, when we get to that time of the year, it's not bad Friday that we celebrate, is it? What do we call it today? That's right, Good Friday. Why? Because we get to look at the cross in the rearview mirror in retrospect and realize that we live in the goodness and benefits of what happened because of His suffering. So when we suffer, we must remember that God still works good out of everything. And secondly, we should remember that God is the hope giver. Now, Joseph met two men in prison, the king's cupbearer and the baker. They both had dreams that they needed interpreted, so Joseph told them what their dreams meant. For one of the prisoners... His dream meant that he would get out of prison in a very short time and be fully restored to his position. After telling the man the dream, the meaning of the dream, Joseph asked if he would remember him. When you do get out of here, would you remember me? And, and would you plead my case before Pharaoh since, since he has falsely imprisoned me? And this was the cupbearer, and the cupbearer assured Joseph he would do that. But notice this, notice verse 23 of chapter 40. The chief cupbearer, this was after he was released from prison. The chief cupbearer, however, did not remember Joseph. He forgot him. There's that word that we began with this morning, forgot. Now I'm sure Joseph had some glimmer of hope here. 
thinking that when this guy gets to Pharaoh and tells him, uh, tells him my story, surely Pharaoh will pardon me and I'll be free. But for years, not days, not weeks, not months, but maybe 13 years, Joseph languished in this dreary, dank, dark jail, forgotten. And imagine how every day must have seemed like forever to him. I, I can remember as a kid, some Saturdays I had to do yard work. And that was a terrible day for me. I still hate yard work, but it really was bad when I was a kid. And it seemed like on those Saturdays that the time just dragged by. Do you know what I mean? But, when I, but as a kid, when I played ball on Saturday, well, before I even knew it, we'd played all day and it was dark and time to go home, right? For Joseph, time was at a standstill. Every day was eternity. And I'm just sure that his faith in God grew weaker and weaker as each day passed. Like, have you ever been so down or so hurting that you were just sure God maybe somehow had forgotten you? That was Joseph. Praying and trusting every day that God was at work, that His deliverance was right around the corner, yes. But when the, but when the next morning came, there was nothing. Ah, but here's the deal. Joseph could not see the end of his story. He didn't know that he would indeed be released. He didn't know that next to Pharaoh, he would one day become the most powerful man in all of Egypt. He did not know that he would be reunited with his family. He did not know that he would save his family from starvation because of a coming famine in the land. He did not know that he would provide inspiration for generations to come because his story would be included in Scripture. Joseph didn't know that his story would end with such blessing. But listen, as far as our story goes, we do. I mean, we know. Because we have verse after verse in our Bible telling us Things like, I know the plans I have for you. Plans to bless you and not harm you. Plans to give you hope in the future, yes? Or, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Or, I will supply all your need in Christ Jesus. Or, I am the Lord who heals you. Or, I am, I am the Lord who delivers you. Promise after promise declaring that in the midst of our suffering, we can hope and trust in Him. So when we suffer, we should remember that, number one, God still works good out of everything. Number two, God is the hope giver. And last of all, God expects me to look beyond myself to others. In verse 5, it says this, Each of the two men, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt, who were being held in prison, had a dream the same night and each dream had a meaning of its own. When Joseph came to them the next morning, he saw that they were dejected. So he asked Pharaoh's officials who were in custody with him in his master's house, Why do you look so sad today? So both the cupbearer and the baker had dreams that disturbed them. And Joseph picked up on that. He saw that they were dejected. And he asked about them. He, he, he said, why, why are you sad? Why do you look so sad? Now that's rather incredulous when you consider that here's Joseph in prison for a crime he did not commit. These men had committed a crime he had not. Think about that. He could have easily uh, been so angry that he didn't care about their situations, or he could have complained himself. He could have played the my life is way worse than your life game. Did you ever play that game? I know some married couples who play it all the time, frankly. One says, hey, I'm stuck here at the house with these kids and they're driving me crazy while you're at your job without a care. And then the other one responds, oh, really? Well, while you're playing games and going shopping and to the beach with the kiddos, I have to work for a living. Try that one for a week or two, right? That's that blame game. 
Joseph easily could have said to his jailmates, Oh yeah? You think you have problems? Check this out. First, my brothers tried to kill me. Then they sold me into slavery. Then my boss's wife sexually harassed me and accused me of rape and threw me into this prison. Oh, and what was your problem again? Oh, yeah, you had yourself an unsettling dream. Oh, sorry, my bad. I mean, that could have been his response. But instead, Joseph gets beyond his own misery. Now, this is important. He gets beyond his own uh, misery and notices their pain and their problems. And he's compelled by that to go ahead and offer comfort by interpreting their dreams. Verse 9. So the chief cupbearer told Joseph his dream. He said to him, In my dream I saw a vine in front of me, and on the vine were three branches. As soon as it budded, it blossomed, and its clusters ripened into grapes. Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes, squeezed them into Pharaoh's cup, and put the cup in his hand. This is what it means, then, Joseph said to him. The three branches are three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your position, and you will put Pharaoh's cup in his hand, just as you used to do when you were his cupbearer. And then in verse 16, he interpreted the baker's dream. When the chief baker saw that Joseph had given a favorable interpretation, he said to Joseph, Hey, I too had a dream. On my head were three baskets of bread. In the top basket were all kinds of baked goods for Pharaoh, but the birds were eating them out of the basket on my head. So basically, Joseph says, Cupbearer, Your dream means that Pharaoh's going to let you out of prison in three days. You're going to get your old job back. Congratulations. Give me a high five, bro. Everything's good. And the baker gets all fired up and says, Oh, me too, me too. Tell me my dream. Well, Joseph responds, Ooh, baker. Sorry, dude. Your dream means that Pharaoh's going to cut off your head and feed your body to the birds. And the baker's like, seriously, Joseph? That's the last time I'm telling you one of my dreams. But the point is, in his misery and suffering, Joseph notices their pain and steps out of himself, beyond himself, to serve them. You see, it's often through serving others that God heals us of our own hurts and lifts us out of our own painful morass. In fact, the renowned psychiatrist Carl Menninger was once asked what he would advise a person who was on the verge of a nervous breakdown. He responded, I would say to that person, find someone who has a need and then go do something for that person. Because Menninger knew that people who serve are rarely down long. And hear me. I'm not saying that if you're really depressed or suffering badly, that you should just get out there and spread the love to others, suck it up, buttercup, the sun will come out tomorrow and all that. No, that's not what I'm saying. Because there are those times when we must receive from others ourselves, aren't there? Because we have nothing in the tank to give. However, somewhere in the healing process, there will be that time when you must get up when you must get beyond yourself to truly move forward in complete wholeness. And by the way, getting beyond ourselves to serve others is not just for our times of suffering. It's also, and maybe more so, for the times others are suffering too. And because we are literally the body of Christ on this earth, it behooves us to bring them hope in His name. In fact, I tell our church often that every time we get together and do an outreach project and or help others in need, and even each week when we broadcast our service online, that's us getting beyond ourselves and giving hope 
to others. Speaking of our online service, when we first began to do it, I received a letter from a woman named Tracy. She'd been grieving her mother who had recently died. Well, after she found our ministry online, Tracy wrote this letter. She said, Pastor Mike Haley, God truly works in wonderful ways. I was crying this week and really missing my mom. I'm living out of two suitcases with no other possessions, no money, etc., staying with my daughter. Huge slump in my life. Saw your invite live on the news feed, on your, on your news feed, went on your page to watch your service. I am renewed. I love this. I am renewed. You will never know just how much I needed your words today. I'm currently living in Iowa, but moving so soon overseas. And you have given me back my strength. Not sure if I'm expressing myself well. Please keep doing your live, feed, your live feeds and God bless you in your church. Now, isn't that beautiful? Here's the deal. She was ministered to and she received some healing and some relief. Watch this. She was blessed by God through us and then we were blessed by God through her. Why? Because all of us together got beyond ourselves while trusting and hoping in God. Listen, God still works good out of everything. He's the hope giver. And when you get beyond yourself, you're going to see uh, things in the rearview mirror that are going to make you want to stay facing forward. And when you get beyond yourself in someone else's life and make a difference for them, it will be the highlight of your day, the highlight of your week. It might be the highlight of your life. You will never know. Well, that's it for today. Thank you for joining me. Thank you so much. Uh, you can see any of our previous episodes or you can contact me by email through our website at newdaychurchbrandon.org or you can uh, send me a personal message through most every social media venue. I would love to hear from you. I'd love to be able to pray for you or answer any questions that you have. God willing, we'll see you again next week, okay? Have a blessed week. Bye-bye.